gosh, what, what a nice introduction. Thank you very much. It's great to be back at Berkeley, uh, one of my favorite places here. Do you need to do something? Oh, okay. <laughs> that would be good. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to tell you how, no, I'm not going to tell you how enzymes do it. I have no clue how enzymes do it in water. But the wonderful fact is that they do. So let's see, as soon as I get my pretty pictures up, um, we'll have, oh, actually, I want to say, Pranilla, where are you? That was such a great introduction to proteins, right? So I could have cut out half my slides, and, but now I can just assume that you know everything that there is to be known about proteins, how wonderful they are. The best chemists on the planet, sorry chemists, but the enzymes are far better than you, doing all the chemistry uh, of life in water using renewable resources, sunlight, carbon dioxide, making wonderful things like trees, human beings, bacteria. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to use this chemistry of life to do chemistry for us? Instead of pumping oil out of the ground and warming up our planet, maybe we could do the same things that life does and use in a recyclable, renewable fashion the chemistry of life to make what we need in our daily lives. And so that's what got me interested in enzyme. And of course, it was also taking Judith Klinman's fabulous course on enzyme mechanisms back when I was a graduate student, trying to figure out how they do it. I never did figure out how they did it, but I got very interested in building new ones. So here I am, a chemical engineer at Berkeley, at the beginning of the DNA revolution, where we could go in and actually rewrite the code of life the DNA, to make new biological objects. And I wanted to do it with enzymes. So the problem is nobody knew how to do this, right? I had this grand vision of making new enzymes, but no one knew how to engineer them. Well, this isn't working. All right, here we go. No one knew how to do it. And if, you, if no one knows how to do it, what do you do? You go and look at whatever has worked. And what works is the simplest and best engineering process on the planet, and that's called evolution. So this simple algorithm of making mutations and natural selection has over hundreds of millions of years, even billions of years of evolution on this planet created all this remarkable diversity of enzymes and everything else. A simple process, and I use this analogy of a little machine because it is an algorithm of mutation and natural selection that's done it. So the idea then was, okay, if you don't know how to do it from, say, a model or first principles, then maybe you can use this process of evolution. Nope, this is not working. Okay. They want me to stand behind here. No, it's the, I, it's the slide advancer. No, no, I, it's the slide advancer. All right, so here we have this, this fabulous process called evolution that could work. Not a new idea, folks. I never claim to invent evolution. Humans have been doing this, making new biological entities for thousands of years. We have made everything from corn to carrier pigeons, lab rats, racehorses. We have made things that help us survive, Eat foods like this corn. Uh, we make things that give us comfort, like that poodle, not even biologically fit. If that got out in my neighborhood in Southern California, it would be eaten immediately by coyotes. But it gives us pleasure, and we have created it by choosing who mates with whom, right? And who goes on to give the next generation. Why, we didn't even know what DNA was when human beings were creating new biological objects by artificial selection. Now, 
in the barnyard and in uh, natural evolution, the fuel for evolution, this underlying genetic diversity, is kind of limited, right? Um, monkeys go with monkeys and worms go with worms, but you're not going to cross the two and get anything beautiful. And yeah, you can go out and smoke a few cigarettes. Maybe um, you'll dial in a few random mutations, but you can't really control that. And so it's a very conservative process in the animal breeding world, let's say. But you know, ever since that DNA revolution, that's completely changed. Because now, that underlying diversity can be created in the test tube, and you can cross monkeys and worms, and birds and wolves, and whatever it is you want. I do not make Wolford. That is my laboratory mascot. And in fact, I have a few pins for those of you who ask questions, high school students only. And um, that's my lab mascot. We do not make uh, wolf birds, but it's there to give this idea that you can now mix any DNA you want. You can dial in any level of mutation you want. You can have three parents. You can have 33 parents. That's amazing, right? But the problem was is we didn't know what the rules were. Nobody knew what the rules were in order to use this process to speed up evolution and discover new biological entities in the form of enzymes. I want you to think a little bit about what could you make if you free evolution from the constraint of supporting current life. That's what we're doing. We're taking it out of the test tube, we're taking it into the test tube, out of the biological context. And we have this universe, and I mean literally the size of the universe and many orders of magnitude beyond, of possible biologies, of possible protein sequences. And out there, I will tell you, there's the cure to the energy crisis. There's the cure to cancer. There's maybe even the cure to death and taxes. But you just have to find it. And that's really the hard part. In this universe of possibilities, most of which is just junk, sequences that don't encode anything useful, you have to find these new things that you're looking for. And I'll just defend all of you who are biochemists and biologists. You study that little tiny green fraction of sequences, proteins that do something in biology. As an engineer, all the space is mine. I can go and explore proteins that would not exist, the poodles of the universe that would not exist without my intervention. But those could be quite interesting. All right, let's get into the engineering. So the real question, the hard question was, how do you do this without 10 to the ninth graduate students or 10 to the ninth years? And get something, let's say, useful on the order of tenure time. And the real trick came from understanding this, this is an optimization problem whose landscape we really didn't understand, right? Where we're trying to alter the sequence that encodes function and function is defined by me. I'm the breeder of molecules, so I decide who lives and who dies and who's doing a good job, and I just measure that. So that's your y-axis and the sequence is all the other dimensions. And it could be really rugged. And we're, if you're trying to optimize on a rugged landscape, that's very hard. Because any time you take a change in the sequence, you fall into a crevasse of known function, and evolution stops. On the other hand, if it's smooth, any fool can get to the top of good function. You just close your eyes and take the first step uphill, and you keep going, right? So people smarter than I, many years ago, argued that this landscape had to be more smooth than rugged. And I'll let you think about that. Uh, but one simple answer to that question is we wouldn't be here to talk about it if it weren't smooth. But why is that? You should ask yourselves. In any case, if it's smooth, you can apply a very simple strategy to evolve on such a landscape. And that just is, and you heard all about this in Pernilla's wonderful lecture, you can use recombinant DNA technology, take a gene 
from the bottom of your shoe, one of these remarkable products of four billion years of evolution in this vast space of possible sequences that actually does something, put that into bacteria and make a couple mistakes in it at random. So if you copy it under error prone conditions, you can make billions, hundreds of billions of copies of this DNA that has a few mutations in it. You don't want to make too many because then you jump into those crevasses of non-function. And the cells will read that and start making proteins that have the mutations. And then comes the hard part for the human being, and that is deciding who lives and who dies. And it's not really living or dying because it's an enzyme, but it, who goes on to parent the next generation. And that's called good old-fashioned analytical chemistry, where you measure what you're interested in. Does your enzyme catalyze the reaction that you want under the conditions you want? If it does, it, and it does it a little bit better than its parent, then you put it back into the cycle. If it doesn't, in the old days, you just went tra straight to the trash can. In the new days, we feed it into machine learning algorithms, but that's a, for another lecture. And basically, you can just use this iterative process to optimize on your landscape. So it just looks like this. You start with an enzyme that nature made for you. It does its job pretty well. You ask it to do a new job. It's generally less enthusiastic about that. So function drops. Say you ask it to work on a new substrate or to even catalyze a new reaction. If that uh, sits at the base of a new fitness peak, you just turn the crank of mutation and artificial selection and force it to do the new job. And that works really, really well. In fact, I would say thousands, many thousands of enzymes now, and everything from your laundry detergents to uh, manufacturing of drugs, lots of consumer products, all the reagents in your DNA sequencing, you name it, they've been optimized by a process just like this. I mean, after all, what self-respecting enzyme wants to work in your washing machine, right? With surfactants and, you know, wide range of temperatures. They don't like to do that, but you can convince them to do that by making a little bit of changes to their sequence and looking for this new fitness optimum. And we learned a lot of interesting things over the years. This process was invented almost 30 years ago now. I've had lots of uh, chance to learn things from it. And I'll tell you a few things I and others have learned. It works. Proteins adapt by this simple uphill walk. What we didn't know is how quickly they would adapt. Would it take 100 mutations, as you often see in natural sequences? Or could you adapt in just a few? And it turns out the answer is just a few. When you're just forcing adaptation, and People who develop antibiotics, for example, are really unhappy about this fact because we get resistance to things like that almost immediately. Now, here's the scary fact for those of you who think you would like to design an enzyme. People really want to do that. Maybe some of you would like to do that. Here's your challenge. We found many years ago, that the beneficial mutations, right? If you're making mutations randomly over the sequence, where do the good ones pop up? A lot of times, they would pop up 20, 30 angstroms away from the active site of the enzyme, where they'd give a two-fold, five-fold increase in activity, but we couldn't even ex explain them, much less predict them which is what you'd have to do in, in a rational design process. So we knew that this was going to be hard, and it's still hard today. We don't understand how these things work well enough to sit down and compose them. I often use this. You know, We know how to, to read DNA. We know how to write it. You can synthesize DNA. We know how to edit DNA. Jennifer Doudna here at Cal. But we don't know how to compose DNA. That code of life is a four billion years of evolution has composed that. And evolution can compose new DNA, but humans are still not very good at it. All right, that earned me the greatest accolade of my life. 
when I got to go down, a few blocks down from my house, to Warner Brothers Studio and appear on the set of The Big Bang Theory. How many of you all watch it? I don't know, do high school students watch this silly show anymore? A few, a few, okay, all right. I, I, I hadn't watched it very much before I got asked to appear on it. They had to dig really deep to get a chemist to appear. because it. But do you know I was the only woman ever to appear playing herself on the Big Bang Theory? It's about graduate students at Caltech. They're, they're endearing graduate students, but over 12 seasons, they become really annoying professors lobbying for Nobel Prizes, so it's good that the show is over. But it was really a lot of fun. I wasted a perfectly good morning going down there and doing that. And I also got invited to this very cool party in, in Stockholm in 2018. And I have to say, um, they do a great job, so if you're ever invited, you should go. Definitely. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Anyway. So what have I been doing since then? This is the big question that I want to explore with evolution. And that's going where nature has never gone before. I mean, it's easy to write a sequence that nature has not made, right? AI, generative AI is doing that. Your chat GTP for proteins can write out all sorts of new protein sequences. But they can't necessarily do something new. There's a big difference between write out a, writing out a protein that folds and one that can do something. So I would like to create proteins, enzymes, that do chemistry that biology never explored. Gosh, where would you even start, right? So let me see if I can explain a little bit. First of all, it's a hard problem but I realized it's something that nature does all the time. Nature makes new enzymes. Now, you think all of biology has already been created. Think again, right? We're in just the middle of a dynamic evolution, and new functions are appearing all the time. I just want to add one or two to that big, long list. Often, nature does it in response to challenges we place on the environment, like this potent herbicide atrazine dumped on the planet, millions of pounds of this stuff, thought to be non-biodegradable, until some microbe figured out if it could take that chlorine off, it would have a rich nitrogen source that gave it a selective advantage over its neighbors. Then it went all over the world, and now atrazine is biodegradable. And it turns out, how did that happen so fast? Because I learned from Judith Klenman, that enzymes are really complicated, and they have all these functional groups that are so beautifully positioned, and their thermal networks and all this that are so beautifully tuned that, um, that, you know, to design something like this would be super hard, and to evolve it would be even harder, because the probability of randomly finding a new active site would be so low as to be foolish. But nature doesn't worry about that. Nature creates enzymes all the time. So it has to be a process pretty much like that high probability process I just described to you. And nature does it all the time because new functions are already there. They're already out there in this vast diversity of the biological world. Think about it. They're like high school students. You're selected for your ability to study all the time you know, maybe you could have fun once in a while, or do dishes, or go out and get a, a part-time job, right? You have many capabilities that aren't being drawn upon, but then could be fuel for your next step in life. And you don't necessarily know what that next step in life, well, the next step for an enzyme might be, ooh, I can degrade atrazine, and therefore my, the ones that do it better, that have a one or two mutations away from its parent, that do better are going to do, they're going to reproduce and go all over the world. And this means that we can use these, what we call promiscuous functions, these side activities that weren't being selected, but are just there because enzymes have diverse capabilities, can then become the fuel for evolution by artificial selection for optimization. So let me give you an example. We um, argued that uh, if you look at a cytochrome P450, which activates oxygen, 
This is its natural function. Maybe this iron heme protein could activate, could form a reactive carbene intermediate. Chemically, it looks a lot like its native function. Not entirely, but, you know, kind of similar. And um, if it could, maybe then it could transfer that carbene to a second substrate, and then it would do a whole slew of chemical reactions that only human chemists knew about. So our idea was maybe we could go to the human chemistry literature and import some of those ideas into enzymes. No such enzyme has ever been found in nature. But we argued maybe it could happen. And then, if it could happen, does it evolve? So let me give you a great example, my favorite example. Silicon chemistry. There's no carbon-silicon bonds known in the biological world. None. Everybody wonders, you know, why not silicon-based life? But you can't find any reports of carbon-silicon bonds made by nature. But humans make them, and they make them with metal complexes. It's, t it's really terrible chemistry. This asymmetric uh, formation of carbon-silicon bonds is not very efficient. It's uh, been reported with copper and iridium and rhodium. Notice no iron was ever reported. A few turnovers, you know, on the order of 50 or so. Some nice selectivities, but really not anything that you'd ever want to use in bulk. But that gave us enough idea to think that perhaps an iron complexing protein like a cytochrome P450 could form a reactive carbene. So basically the catalyst is taking this highly reactive diazo species up on the top. That N2 blows off drives the formation of the carbene in the protein, then, that tra then another substrate comes in, and that forms your new carbon uh, silicon bonds. And by golly, we just went to the refrigerator and just tested a bunch of heme-containing proteins and found that this super stable little protein from a hot, salty pool in Iceland, I didn't go to Iceland, we pulled it off the databases, synthesized the gene, and found out it catalyzes this reaction really well. What does it do? It takes dimethylphenylsilane, inserts uh, the carbene from that diazo species in there, and makes a new silicon carbon bond. And does it notice 40 turno turnovers? That's as good as the best human chemistry that had been reported. That's just as good. It's not a natural function of the protein. In fact, the protein is an electron transfer protein, and it's super stable, very nice property to have. It's so stable you can even give it to a chemist, and they won't know it's a protein. You can just say it's your magic catalyst, and it does it really well. Now, if you're a biochemist, you want to say, whoa, gosh, that's really odd. How does a protein like that catalyze such a reaction? Because we all know that cytochrome Cs don't have any free binding sites, right? The, the iron is coordinated by the nitrogens in the heme and a methionine above and a histidine below, and there's just not much room in there for chemistry to happen. And in fact, if you take your little computer ball and roll it over the active site, this is one of the things people like to do to measure the volume that might be accessible. What do you get? You get a big, fat zero. There's no space in the active site. Well, I think it's really important for you to remember that nature really doesn't care what your calculations say. This protein catalyzes this reaction. And not only does it catalyze this reaction, it evolves. So you can take this simple algorithm, right? Turn the crank of mutation and artificial selection. And over three rounds of mutation, we were able to take it up to on the order of 16, 1800 turnover numbers, which was enough to get us published in a snooty journal, because this reaction was completely novel in the biological world. So it, it, it evolved readily to catalyze this chemistry. And in fact, one of the authors on that paper, Kai Chen, is here in the audience. He's a postdoc in the Doudna lab. Uh, he did a lot of this work on this project. And I'll just share with you, because uh, this is part of water. How did that happen? 
every once in a while, do the, we do go back and ask, how do they work? So in this case, we got a, um, a high resolution crystal structure of the evolved protein because we were curious, how did three mutations in the active site give such a good catalyst? Uh, and Rusty Lewis then was able to get a, a crystal structure. And what you see is that the ligand that usually binds to the iron had been mutated to an aspartate. So it was a methionine, that's a good coordinating ligand to the iron, it mutated to an aspartate. And what happened is that got pulled out to interact with solvent. And to interact with solvent, it also pulled out this whole loop over the, over the protein. So that created all that yellow blob there is the new measurement of the free space of the active site. So it created a binding pocket for the substrates that made this uh, more capable. This would be very hard to design, right? Because it's an interaction, a specific interaction with water, which usually is not taken into account explicitly in designs. And it is also this floppy loop that gets created and that allows access of these uh, new substrates to the active site. Here's another great, recent, very recent example. This is a protein we evolved because diazo compounds that we're using to form the carbenes can be very explosive. That's why we don't take high school students in my lab. Uh, and so to get away from some of the explosive carbenes, we went to diazerines. And to make a long story short, Nick Porter spent couple years of his life convincing an enzyme to activate diazerines. He was successful. But the fun part was all the screening he had to do. He screened 500 conditions in order to get the most miserable little, you know, needly crystals uh, to get a structure of this thing. And he just couldn't. He was a really good structural biologist, but we just couldn't get anything going. In fact, 10 angstrom resolution. We weren't going to learn anything from this. So in comes new technology, love new technology. Tamir Gonan and Emma Dunn Elias at UCLA took our miserable little crystals. What did they do? We had worked so hard to get these crystals. They ground them up. They ground up our little crystals and making them even smaller crystals, micro electron diffraction, put them out on a grid and obtained a high resolution crystal structure of the protein for us. In fact, one of the few uh, de novo structures that have been gotten, uh, proteins that have gotten by this new method. And I'll run you through, uh, I'll run you through the kind of a quick story on this. You've all heard of AlphaFold. You can now, using AI, machine learning on the protein database, predict, given a sequence, how, what it'll fold into. So when we gave AlphaFold the sequence of our evolved protein, what did it do? It said, oh, it's a protoglobin, and it forced the evolved sequence into the known, whatever few examples of a known uh, structure it had for a protoglobin. Uh, so that you see on the left. It's an AlphaFold model where um, it, it, uh, it is forcing it into the known structure. Now, the actual structure of the same sequence looks significantly different. That's in blue. The actual structure of the evolved sequence has a tunnel now where the substrate can get into the heme. And this is an important, I think it's a really important thing to realize. Alpha fold is great, but it can't tell you the details. And evolution is all about the details. So there were, you know, five or six mutations in this protein that opened up that active site. But AlphaFold can't predict those. It can't tell you what those are doing. So uh, in fact, it shows it very nicely, I think, on this uh, figure here. It's all about water. One of the main mutations was to an arginine. And what AlphaFold does is it forces that arginine to be pointing in the same direction as its precursor amino acid in the wild type. So it's really forcing it to be into what it thinks the wild type structure is. But actually, in the blue structure, the real structure, the arginine gets pulled out to interact with water. And that now unfolds that alpha helix there and opens up an active site. Isn't that cool? 
So we also, so these are such tiny crystals that you can just add the reactive diazo, right? It forms the carbene. You dump that in liquid nitrogen. You run off to the beam line, and you capture the structure of the carbene. That is an actual structure of the reactive carbene in the active side of the protein, stabilized by the protein. And those tiny modifications in the active site as a result of evolution give the carbene a nice stacking interaction with the phenylalanine side chain. So now we've got it caught, and uh, you can see more or less what is happening. Now, this is the philosophical debate. Do you understand it? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand it, but I can see it. At least I have a picture, a comic book cartoon of what's happening in there. So basically, we, we can see then that now, once you have the carbene, so in orange, uh, without the carbene species, you've got the blue structure. The carbene then kind of stabilizes that floppy loop so it, you see a small change in the access to the active site in the presence of the substrate. All right, evolution is amazing. So we've taken this basic story and kind of beaten it to death. We've created enzymes just in the last 10 years that can do a whole slew of reactions that even humans can't do, including making bicyclobutanes and a number of uh, selective reactions that are even well beyond uh, the chemistry that you can find in your old Jack's journals, which were our original demonstrations. Because this protein scaffold gives you a lot of power over the chemistry and over the selectivity. And I'll just say, it hasn't stopped here. So if anybody's really interested in chemistry, this interface between biology and chemistry is such a wonderful space. Because you can add, you can take this idea in lots of different directions, right? If you can make carbenes, why not nitrines? And I'll say, you know, over 10 years, we've taken it in many different directions. Yang Yang set ethyl methyl stereo centers with enzymes with nitrine transfer, and I'll just point out some very recent work. Uh, in 2020, we showed you could use simple hydro... We were using azides, which are very highly activated, but now we're using hydroxylamines, uh, esters, and even free, now, just plain old hydroxylamine to drive these reactions, where you can just plug on a free amine group. Biology doesn't do this. This is chemistry that's completely unprecedented in the biological world, and some of it is completely unprecedented in chemistry. For example, this ability to plug a, an amino function onto an unactivated hydrocarbon. That's crazy. But a protein can do it. Uh, we're not sure how, uh, but it certainly can do it, and can do it with, uh, with selectivity that's just amazing. In fact, if you read Derek Lowe's opinion piece he wrote recently on, uh, on the paper on the activation of hydrocarbons. He said, here's a reaction that looks like alchemy to most of us in the synthetic community. They look like magic because they're doing chemistry you just cannot do with what we have now. But you know what? It's not magic, right? It's not magic at all. It's like transition metal chemistry that chemists have been doing for more than 100 years. Only it's DNA encoded, it's self-assembling, and it's highly evolvable. What's not to like about that? And it does it in water. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a fun place to be, because what, what are we going to do? I think over the next couple of decades, we're going to see this convergence of chemistry knowledge with biology, right? This interface of chemistry and biology, where we can now think about genetically encoding our favorite reactions and coming up with pathways to take these renewable resources and turn them into the chemicals that we currently get from fossil fuels. I find that a very exciting vision, uh, and we've just scratched the surface, folks. There's so much more to be discovered. People do it. Sometimes we do it in water. Uh, here's my group at the beach, November beach, but Southern California is really nice. So thank you very much. Sorry.